appreciate that, Brother Dwayne. Amen. I'm thankful that God comes to where we're at. Amen. Um, this morning, we're going to start back Children's Church. So if you have any young people that are eight years old and under, if you would like to go to Children's Church, the Don and Miss Kathy are going to teach that. You can be dismissed at this time. And um, Miss Connie, if there's any kids that need to know how to get there, if you don't care to show them. And the rest of us, if you would stand with me and turn your Bibles to the book of Haggai. Haggai the prophet. We looked at Habakkuk last Sunday. This morning, we're going to look at Haggai or Haggai, if you want to pronounce it that way. I've heard it pronounced several different ways. Um, but Haggai the prophet, beginning in chapter 1 and verse 1. Haggai the prophet. The book of Haggai, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, the scripture reads, it says, In the second year of Darius the king, the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time of the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, and you bring in little. You eat and you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You, you clothe you, yet there's none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put him in a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it, why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because mine house is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands." Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you again this morning. We thank you for this time of worship. We're thankful for your amazing grace that we got to sing about. We're thankful for that in that song that was new to me, uh, but a reminder of the fact that Gal Calvary bore our burden, our sin burden, the burdens of life you tell us to cast upon you for you care for us. As we learned in our Sunday school class this morning in Isaiah 53, that you bore our iniquity, that all of our sorrows and all of our griefs and all the cares comes along with being in a fallen world you came to take on upon yourself. And we're thankful today that because of who you are, it's well with our soul. And when we trust in you, no matter what we go through, we know that you took care of all of our sin, that you have forgiven us of our sin if we have been saved, and that you're coming back soon and very soon. And we're thankful that before your return, just like Brother Dwayne sang about, that you always find us where we're at. Sometimes we're in a bad spot in life, but you find us where we're at. 
Sometimes we're on the mountains and we think that we don't even need you sometimes. But yet you don't give up and you find us where we're at. So I pray today that as we uh, look to your word, that you would have me behind the cross once again. Give me a fresh anointing of your spirit. To preach your word. I pray, Lord, for someone lost within the sound of my voice, that you would bring great conviction in their hearts, showing them their need to turn from their sin and repentance, trust in you, Savior and Lord. For us who are saved, may we hear like these folks heard in this passage. May our spirits be stirred. May we be motivated to be about your work as we go forward in this time. We'll give you honor and glory for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, we looked at the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk was the prophet that was preaching to the southern kingdom, and he was fed up with what he was experiencing. And he was preaching, but the people didn't want to hear the word. He was preaching about the importance of turning to the Lord, yet they continued to turn away from the Lord all the more. And he was fed up. He was disgusted and tired with what was going on in the southern kingdom and the lack of respect for the Lord and for the law. And, and so he began to cry out to God and ask God, how long are you going to put up with all this? How long is it going to be before you discipline your children? And then God said, okay, Habakkuk, I'm going to hear your prayer and I'm going to answer your prayer even right now. I want you to go up here and look. And as he went to look, he seen the Babylonian army. God said, I'm going to raise up the people of the Chaldeans, the, ba the, bar the Babylonians who are going to come, and they're going to come quick. They're going to, their chariots are going to be faster than the lepers and the, how the eagle flies where his prey, and then they come. They're not going to really give any grace or any mercy. They're going to come. And all of a sudden, Habakkuk says, hold on a second. You have chose to use a worse people than we are to bring judgment upon us. Let me tell you something, folks. God uh, is a God who will get our attention one way or the other. And we find that that's what he was doing there 70 years plus before Haggai. And the people had been in captivity for 70 years after Nebuchadnezzar came down, leading the army of the Babylonians three different times to break three different sieges. sieges finally, he destroyed the walls of Jerusalem. He destroys the temple. And the people were gone for 70 years into captivity. Well, Zerubbabel was able to bring a group back. And then Ezra brought a group back. And then Nehemiah brought the final group back and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. You would think that the people were excited. When Zerubbabel brought the first group back, they were. They started to build the temple. They started with building the altar. They started then building the foundation of the temple. But then they got some opposition, and they got some pressure, and they were told to stop, and they stopped the work. When they stopped the work, then they got comfortable not doing the work. And they went on about their life. They built homes as they were back in the land, and they were going about their everyday life while the temple of God laid waste. Now, for you and for me, I, I think it may be hard for us to understand this because we're not accustomed to a temple today. And back in the Old Testament, God first brought the people out of Egypt under Moses' leadership. And when Moses went from Egypt to Mount Sinai and got all the instructions that were there to build a tabernacle, and all the sacrificial system and the law re regarding that, he led them in sacrifices. He had Aaron, the high priest, his brother. He had the Levites that were there as the priests that served. And there was all the sacrificial system and the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, where you could visibly see the presence of God would dwell over the Holy of Holies in that tabernacle and sit upon the mercy seat that was there that represented the throne of God. By a cloudy pillar did he lead them during the day, and a fiery pillar did he lead them by night. And then later, David desired to build a temple. He wasn't allowed, but Solomon was allowed, and he built that glorious temple, and God had then indwelt that place. Well, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it. And when they went back, we find that the people were supposed to build another temple back. 
They didn't. That was the place that God would dwell. Today in the New Testament, that's not the case. We have this facility here that we come and we meet and we have set it aside. We have dedicated this place as a place of worship and a place of ministry and a place of service in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the purpose of spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But with all that, folks, we know that God doesn't dwell in the temple like he used to. He dwells in individuals now. We make up the temple of the living God. You who are saved as described as the holy of holies from the spirit of God, you are described as the lively st stones built together that makes up the spiritual house of God. We are the temple of the living God. But this passage of scripture is applicable to us as much as it was to them. And I want us to see just a few things. As Haggai the prophet was raised up to stir the spirits of the people. Habakkuk was upset and was a prophet that got to see the chastisement of God. Haggai is now going to have to speak to a group of people who have not been back long, who've already grown complacent. Uh, let me, let's just bring it to our day and our culture right now. Eight months ago, whatever it's been, March 14th, I remember that being the day. March 14th was the day that we had our first little news conference with our Daily with Andy. And it was really more than Daily with Andy. Um, it was like two or three times from the first time the coronavirus was spotted and found in Fayette County. It was declared a, national, uh, a state of emergency and and from that point on, it was an everyday thing that we would get our little coronavirus updates and we would get our recommendations about what we should do and how we're supposed to respond. It was then that we were told about not meeting or couldn't meet, or what should be able to open and what's not allowed to open, what's essential, what's non-essential, not just in the church standpoint, but everyday life. And y'all might as well buckle down and get ready because it's coming again. I believe a lot sooner than what you and I think. And um, we better be ready for it. But anyway, with all that said, a lot of things change in our lives, change in our life as a church. I remember when the first weekend come, we, we had our worship service just like normal, and then the next week would come along, and I was trying to think about, well, how should we respond to this? And I remember talking to, to the deacons and talking to y'all and saying, listen, me and my family are going to be here to worship. You guys are more than welcome to come and show up. And uh, we're going to be here to worship on Sunday mornings. And um, and if not here, then we'll be somewhere. But we're going to have church. And we went forward that way. And, and then what we had is that there was folks that, you know, everybody makes decisions on what they think is best or what they think is right. Um, I think we need to make sure that the scriptures are standard no, no matter what our decisions are. But as we make those decisions, I've seen the church I believe right here at Victory Baptist Church, I feel like that in the midst of the crisis, the overwhelming majority made the, the appropriate response, and I think that we've seen some positive out of what could have been a very negative thing in our life. That's been going on for a few months, but let me tell you something, folks. If we're not careful, we can grow complacent and content once again. See, the people of God have this tendency. They have a tendency of this roller coaster type of ride in our lives spiritually. There's times where it seems like we're on the mountaintop and walking with Jesus. Then there's times in which we're at the very bottom in the valley. There seems to be times where we're on fire for him and then we're cold and indifferent to him. And you know what? It seems to be just like a roller coaster. I mean, I don't know if you go to amusement parks much and I go, I take my kids. I got old quick. I used to like them. Now I don't really care not a thing about them. And it's not because I'm afraid. It's just because I don't like getting dizzy. And I don't like feeling sick. So I just quit riding them things. Um, I used to ride them all the time. But it seems like you get up to the top of the hill and you're at the bottom of the hill. You're up to the top of the hill and you're at the bottom of the hill. You twist it around, flip it around and here. In the two minutes, that ride's over. You waited 45 minutes to ride a two and a half minute, if that minute ride that took you up, down, flipped you this way, that way. Is that not the Christian life? Today you're up here, tomorrow you're down here, you're flipped over here, you're flipped over there, and you don't know exactly what to do. I'm thankful that God doesn't change, 
Sometimes we go through some difficulties. Sometimes we are where we need to be with Christ, and other times it seems like we're not, and it seems to be like this. You would think that the people that Haggai is addressing, he wouldn't have to be confronting them about the issues that he's confronting them with. You would think that after, you know, Solomon's temple was destroyed. They were in captivity for 70 years. God worked a miracle. They were back into the land. They had the opportunities to rebuild the temple and to get to worship like they were supposed to, yet they grew content and comfortable going about life, and God was not number one in their life. You come on this coming Wednesday for Bible study. We'll be in another prophet. His name is Malachi. Malachi is going to address a very similar issue with the people. He's going to talk to them, and he's going to say, you know, why why is it that, that the donkey knows his master, but you don't know me, and I've treated you like a father? Why is it that you're stealing from me? And they're like, what are you talking about? And they won't give their tithes, their offerings. He calls them God robbing thieves. He says, you guys are robbing from me? When I take care of you, what is, why are you in such a shape? And folks, it didn't take long for a people who are restored into the land to get to a spot where God's having to raise up prophets to confront them about their complacency and then walk in the flesh and fulfilling their own desires instead of being committed to the one true and living God. The thing is dangerous for us. Scary, really, how quick. We can be serving him like we're supposed to be and then comfortable and content and really just just blah, just in the flesh, just as Jesus described in in, in Revelation chapter 3 to the church of Laodicea, lukewarm. How many of you, when you're going to drink something, it's either something hot or it's something cold? There's very few times that you want to grab something that's just room temperature. You know, lukewarm, this isn't peeling. Soup? Who wants to eat lukewarm soup? I'd rather drink it cold, I believe, than just lukewarm. We want it hot. Well, folks, we grow into a spot in our lives if we're not careful, but we are lukewarm, and God is not desiring us to be in such a shape. But let's look at a few things in this passage of Scripture and see what, the, what Haggai the prophet has to say. It says there in verse 1, it says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Before we go any further, I want us to see that every time God addresses the people, who's he address? He addresses political leaders and the religious leaders. Some people tell you don't mix politics and religion. God did it all the time in the Old Testament. The problem is we think we know better than God, and we think we separate things like we think, and when you start doing that, you find yourself in a mess every single time because the king of kings, right, is also the savior of our soul. Jesus is the king of kings and the faithful high priest. Guess what? He is going to rule and reign. The government shall be upon his shoulder. To his kingdom there shall be no end. And he is our faithful high priest who lives forevermore to make intercession for us. He mixed it up pretty good in my opinion. You don't get no better political leader than Jesus. You get no more better religious leader than Jesus neither. Amen? And he took on both roles himself. And so when you got to have a move amongst the people, guess who's addressed? The political leaders and the religious leaders. Guess what, folks? Even in our own country, guess what? We need folks in Washington, D.C. to repent. Guess what? We need folks in Frankfurt to repent. We need political leaders right here in our own communities to repent. Guess what, folks? We need folks in the church house to repent. From pulpits to pews, we need folks to repent of their sin. If God is going to do a move in our midst, it's got to start with the leaders. It's got to start with folks who are leading people to do it to an attitude of repentance. He says this through Haggai the prophet, the Lord, the, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say the time is not come, 
the time that the Lord's house should be built. The prophet Haggai is confronting the people and he's talking to Zerubbabel, the governor, and he's talking to Joshua, the high priest, and he tells them, and he talks about the rest of the people that they have an attitude that the time is not yet to build the temple of God. Because they had some oppositions, they quit midstream. Because they were told, you're not allowed to do this, they stopped. And let me tell you something, folks. When God calls us and we trust in him as Savior and Lord, and we begin to serve him as individual Christians and as the church as a whole, he is the one in whom we are to follow and listen to above everybody else. Now, we submit to authority and we submit to, to government and laws as long as they're not contrary to the law of God. And if they're contrary to the law of God, then we deal with the consequences of dealing with man as we obey God. We don't disobey God because we're worried about man. We have to stay in line with God. Well, the people of Israel this time decided because of the opposition, it must not be the right time to rebuild the temple. And we can't do it right now. Just too many obstacles are in the way. You know, for us in the, in the New Testament and today in 2020, we would have every excuse in the world. You know, we would say things like, you know what? There's mandates. We would say there's recommendations. We would say that there's the coronavirus. We would say whatever it may be. We can't do this or we can't do that because this is what's going on. We have to slow down. We don't have the people. We don't have the resources. You know, throughout church history, there's been things like this said every business meeting. Where are we going to get the money for that? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Well, then we say, well, it's just not time for that. It's not time for this. Well, Haggai the prophet is raised up by the Lord to speak to Zerubbabel and to speak to Joshua and ask them and tell them, the people kept saying, the time has not come. <clears throat> the time of the Lord's house should be built. He said, it's not the right time yet. And then it goes on to say, then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses or your fancy paneled houses and this house lie waste? This is the question that God is asking the people and what God's asking us today. While the kingdom of God should be growing, while the church should be continuing to be built, one lively stone at a time, most churches are lying waste. Most churches are down in number. Most churches are down in baptisms. Most churches down financially. Most churches are down with people who are willing to serve. Most people are down, yet most everybody else is striving to go accomplish whatever goals they have in their own life. They go to their house on a regular basis, but they don't show up to the house of God. They go to work all they want to and make as much money as they can and do whatever they've got on their agenda and their little plans that they have. But when it comes down to the things of God, we will fit him in when it is convenient. We will fit him in. We will fit him in whenever time allows. But in the meantime, we're going to do what we need to do. And we're going to do what we want to do. This is what the nation of Israel was at. A very quick time from when they got brought back into the land to this attitude that they have. Folks, they're just very quick to say, ah, you know, it's not, what do we need to show up to worship service for? What's it matter? Can I worship at home? I mean, Brother Anthony, are you that slow of a learner? The coronavirus taught us that Facebook Live is sufficient. No, Facebook Live is not sufficient. You quarantine in your house, in your jammies, your feet up, your coffee in your hand, thinking you're coming for the presence of the Lord in the name of Jesus as a worship service. It's a disgrace and a joke, really. It is. It really is. I understand folks that are shut in. I understand folks that are physically not able to be where they should be or need to be. I understand an outreach of trying to get into the homes and into avenues of spreading the gospel. 
but well able bodied individuals who name the name of Christ, who have been born again, who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, who experienced the grace of God because of the cross of Calvary, because Jesus bore our sin, he took our place, he died our death, he rose again, he found us, he forgave us, he takes care of us, he indwells us, he's given us his word, he has called us, he's allowed us to serve. Folks, we ought to be about the Lord's work, first and foremost, above everything else. Yet we have many times chosen the easy way, the comfortable way, the fleshly way. They said it's not time yet to build the house of the Lord, but it is time for us to build our houses. It's time for us to, to do what we want. It's time for us to have our plans. I mean, Brother Anthony, don't you understand that we have goals in life and we have things that we need to do? I mean, don't you understand that? Yeah, I understand that. I understand. I understand that when I was growing up, I, I, I thought about getting a career. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't like school in the first place. I thought about a career, and so I tried to work on that, and I was planning on that before God decided to interrupt my life. Amen? I mean, it's all right. I'm glad he interrupted me. I'm glad that he changed some things in my life, but I had my little plan. I had my little goals. I had my little aspirations. I thought I'm going to build my own little kingdom, so to speak. I'm going to do what I need to do, you know. I was, grew up, and there's certain things that I didn't like about growing up in my life, and I'm like, I'm going to change those things. I'm going to do stuff different. I'm going to do, you know, do what I want to do, and then all of a sudden, Jesus interrupts me. Jesus meets me on my road to Damascus, so to speak, and he saves me, and he calls me, and he changes things in my life. And you know what I began to learn as a Christian? This is what I learned, folks. This life, this life right here, and all of our goals that we have, all our little aspirations that we have, everything that we think matters, guess what? It don't matter. You say, what do you mean? Exactly what I said. By themselves, they don't matter. Gain the world, then what? Gain it? What, what are you accomplishing? You know, uh, well, well, I've got my children. I'm do all I can for my children. That's good. I got three of them. I, I like to see them do well. I want to do all I can to, to help them to grow up and to become two great young men for God and one young lady for God. I hope that that's what they do when they get older, and I hope that they continue to be something for the Lord. But what does it matter if they come up and they, they, they become somebody who cures cancer or somebody who does something else? and somebody else who does something else, and they become so great, and they become famous, and they become so influential in this whole world, but it has nothing to do with God. What does it matter? What does it matter if everybody's cured of cancer, and everybody's got the coronavirus is cured, and everybody else who's poor now has money, and everybody's hungry is full, and everybody who's naked is clothed, and everybody's homeless has a home. What does it matter if that happens, and people die without Jesus? What's it matter if you fill your bank account? What's it matter if you feel you've had a great, healthy life for 100 years? And you maybe even like Moses. At 120, he was as strong as he was as a young man. But guess what Moses did? He still died. Guess what Moses took with him? Nothing. But what did it matter for Moses? See, we get so tangled up in the web of life that we forget that this life is exactly what Solomon said. It's vain. It's empty. It's meaningless when Jesus is not at the center of it. He said at the very end of Ecclesiastes, he said this is the whole measure of man. This is the whole purpose of man, that man is to fear God and keep his commandments. He said everything in life that you could do, that you could see, that you could want, I've had, I've done it, I've got the T-shirt, I'm everything that you would want. Solomon had it and did it. And guess what he said? Every bit of it was a waste. Every bit of it was a waste. I don't know why people are the way we are. We have to learn it on our own. When God's given us the scripture that's sufficient for this life and eternal life, we don't have to do all the same things over and over. 
Have you ever watched somebody struggle and reached out and said, you know what, I've been there already. Let me show you how to get past that without going through all the same things. I've met people who won't do that. I've met people who think, I came through it the hard way. You're going to go through it the hard way. That's some of the ignorant stuff I've ever heard of. I'm thinking of my kids. I've learned a lot of things in the 40 years that I've been alive. You don't have to do the same exact thing. Why not teach them the, the, the best way? So when time they get to 40, it's like they're way ahead of where I'm at, right? When I sit here and look at this, these folks were caught up in the tangles of life, in the web of life. And as they were caught up in the, the web of life, they were so focused on their self they went by the temple mount, the place where the temple was supposed to be. And it wasn't there, and it just seemed to not even bother them no more. You know? It didn't even matter. They said they went to their sealed house. He says, why do you go to your fancy homes and my house like waste? He said, I want you to consider your ways. Consider your ways. You know, he says, you've sown much, but you bring in little. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt every time that you think that you're going to get ahead, something happens and you're not ahead anymore? Have you ever felt like, man, I'm really going to get a grip on this today, and I, I really got it, and then all of a sudden something pulls the rug out from underneath you? Let me tell you something, especially if you know the name, of, if you know Jesus and you proclaim the name of Christ. If you're a born-again believer, listen, you're supposed to be putting him first in everything that you do. And as you put him first in everything you do, you let him handle everything else. But when you try to do it on your own, guess what? Guess what? He's going to go ahead and get your attention. You think, man, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to skip out on worship service every once in a while. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reprioritize my life. I'm going to make sure so I can get a little extra money first. So I got to work more. God understands all that. You go work, 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 work. Guess what? You still struggle. You know what I learned? You put God first. You seek his, his kingdom, his righteousness. You give back to him like you're supposed to. Guess what, folks? You can live more off the little bit that you got as God's taking care of you than when you try to have it all figured out yourself. And I'm going to tell you what else. It's a whole lot less stressful when Jesus is taking care of you than when you're taking care of you. I know how that works. I have a hard enough to take care of myself, but then when you think about having a wife and three children, and now my grandpa's there at the house, you know, you think, how in the world can we do all this? You can't. But when you look over at Jesus and say, hey, this is on you. I'm just going to follow you now. Guess what? He created everything out of nothing in six days. He sustains everything as it is today. If his eyes on the sparrow, he knows how many hairs you have on your head. He knows everything about you. There's not a thing too big for him. There's not a thing too little for him. So it's time for us to consider our ways. Maybe you and I got things backwards in life. That's what they had. They had it backwards. You sown much, but you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You're clothed, but you're not warm. You earn all your wages just to put them in bags with holes. Consider your ways. Consider what's going on in your life. And as you're considering your ways, ask the question, could it be, could it just be that I'm really not putting Jesus first in my life? It's very much possibility, isn't it? I mean, think about it. You say, well, I come to worship service. I'm here this morning. Uh, I, you know, but when you start really looking at your life, what gets the most attention? Who gets the most attention in your life? Who is it? Is it your boss? Is it your spouse? Is it your children? Is it your hobbies? Is it yourself? Who gets the most? Who you talk to the most? Where's your resources go the most? Now, Jesus don't ask. Now, Jesus asks, it starts out with a tithe. I won't mention no name, but I got a phone call this, this evening. Or not this evening. It's not this evening yet. This week, to get it right. This week, and it's talking about giving. They said, Brother Anthony, I want to start giving. 
like I'm supposed to give. And I said, man, praise the Lord for that, you know? You start giving. God, God starts with a tithe. That's 10% of all your increase. Proverbs says that you bring in the first fruits to the storehouse. So you don't wait to the end. You don't wait till all your bills are paid and then you give to the Lord whatever's left over. You give to him first and you let him take care of the rest of it. And I can assure you that you start at 10%, that he'll take care of you more with the 90% than you ever can do with 100%. I can assure you that. But I don't think that you stop at 10%. I think that's a starting point. Um, I think that the reality is God owns it all. And I think that you are just simply a steward of what you have. So your, your monies, your homes, your vehicles, your talents that you have, whatever else that you have at your disposal, it's supposed to be the Lord's. It's supposed to be used for his glory, for the furtherance of his gospel, for winning lost people to Jesus and making disciples. So that's what you're supposed to do. And so he says you need to consider your ways because you're in a shape because of that. My house lies waste. You're so busy about trying to have your fancy homes and, and, and whatever other desires you have, that as you're going about life, you, you're eating, but you're not full. You're drinking, but you're still thirsty. You got clothes on, but you're not warm enough. You're earning all your money just to stick them in bags with holes. He says, do you need to check on some things? You know, you need to check on some things. What he's saying is you're not satisfied in this life. And let me tell you something. Jesus said it to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He says, you're giving me something to drink. I'm going to have to get some more. But when I give you something to drink, I'm going to quench your thirst. I'm going to give you a living waters that's going to bubble up and flow out of you. He said, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me to give you a drink. He says that he is the living water that's going to quench your thirst. He's the bread of life that's going to fulfill your hunger desire, hungry desires. He's the one that's there for you. He's going to take care of and satisfy you. The older I get, the longer I walk with Jesus, the more I realize that he is the one that satisfies. He's the one that quenches the thirst. He's the one that's able to satisfy the hunger pains. He's the one that really gives you some, some satisfaction, some contentment, some completeness, some sense of fulfillment. It says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. He says, go up to the mountain, bring some wood, build the house. I'm going to take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified. You know, when I think about what the Lord is saying right here is the Lord is saying, listen, he's even settling I, I mean, it's amazing to see the grace of God in this situation. The people that are going to rebuild Zerubbabel's temple, it's not even going to be near the comparison to Solomon's temple. Not even close. I mean, you go back and you read about Solomon's temple, and you talk about how it's built. Then you talk about the sacrifices that were made the day it was dedicated and everything that went on. This here of Zerubbabel's te temple is an embarrassment compared to what Solomon did. Just, just an embarrassment. And maybe that was one reason they were thinking, oh, well, we have to do, uh, we have to be able to do more. So we do nothing. Have you ever seen that people like that? You know, uh, because I can't give you what I want to be able to get you or what I think you deserve, this is not going to do anything for you. That's when, like, the thought counts, right? At least show some effort. You know, maybe you can't give your, your bride there, the, the biggest diamond that she can, but at least get her something. Hello? Are you with me? You men that want to get married someday and you're going to propose to somebody to marry you, don't give her an IOU. Hello? Because she'll never let you live that down. I can promise you that. You come over there and give her whatever you can with all that you got. And if it's just something out of the Cracker Jack box, some of you are too young to understand that. The little things that get out of the Cracker Jack box ain't much. But you give whatever you can. You show that, hey, whatever I've got, I'm investing in this. I want to marry you. I want 
want to spend the rest of my life with you. And she will take that. And then later on, one of your anniversaries, when you finally become a big dog, then you can get her something. That's, and I'm going to tell you what she'll do. She'll wear that new ring. And she'll like that new ring. But that new ring right there won't ever top that ring that you got her first. It won't. It won't. I mean, she'll wear that big rock proud, but there'll be something else that's more special because we're getting it. But if you say, hey, baby, I want to give you a, the biggest carrot diamond ring I can get you, and I'm going to get it for you someday, and that someday never comes, that's just a whole lot of intentions that are terrible. Well, there's a lot of people that do that with God, isn't it? God, I'm going to do this for you. Just, just let me get my kids raised up a little bit more. They're just babies right now. And I can't bring them to worship service. I mean, they're going to be a distraction. Let me tell you something. We have a nursery here. We just had children's church just dismissed out of here. We do something on, on Sunday nights for the kids and Wednesday nights for the kids. Let me tell you something right here as your pastor. I'm here to tell you right now. If this place right here, at every single one of those babies in that nursery here, all them children that's in the children's shirts here, and every kid that's on Sunday night and Wednesday night here, and I got to listen to crying, or I got to see kids getting up, or they want to go in the bathroom, or these youth over here is a bus, and they're turning around. If that's what I got to deal with while I'm preaching, guess what? I'll deal with it and preach. I'd rather hear the babies cry. I'd rather have to look at those teenagers and say, turn around and get the song book, hush, and get back to preaching, whatever I got to do. I want you to understand something. Your children are not an excuse. Your children are not a burden. Your children are not going to be a distraction. Uh, your children are to be a blessing. They are. They came from God. They're a blessing from God, and we're glad to have them here, and you sure don't need to let them to be an excuse on why you can't be committed. Later on, you got other, other things, your jobs, your hobbies, your whatever it may be. They're not excuse. They're not excuse. You can't say, well, God, as soon as I get this out of the way, I'll, I'll do this for you. As soon as I get this out, you know what God ended up doing? Going ahead and taking them out of your way for you. Right? Why? Because he's a jealous God. He's to be number one. He's to be number one. Jesus said that to be his disciple, you got to hate your mother, your father, your spouse, your children. He's supposed to be number one. He's supposed to be them all, above all of them, folks. Consider your ways. Look what's going on. Just go up to the mountain and get some wood and build my house. Just build my house. Build me a temple. Complete the project. I will take pleasure in it. Why? Because God takes pleasure in the obedience of his people. How many of you, your kids, if you have kids or grandkids, whatever it may be, or somebody just that, that loves you and you, you've helped take care of them, they bring something home to you, whether it's maybe Sunday school, Mother's Day, Father's Day, or some other thing, or they come home from school, or they just color a picture for you, or they write you a note, and they just give it to you. How many people got that? They keep them, right? I got stuff for my kids, you know, that, that they've made for me and Julie, and guess what? They're still around somewhere, you know? They store them up. Why? Because it was special. Was it, was it the Mona Lisa? No. Right? Mona Lisa ain't got nothing on what my kids can do. Hello? You know? I mean, I mean, when, when your kids come and give something to you and do something for you, I mean, it's the best thing ever, ha ever happened, right? You know? Yesterday, I was doing a little work, and uh, AJ and Aiden, they come help me. They come over and help me yesterday morning. Well, we've been, I've been busy, been working a whole lot, and and, uh, but they, they came up yesterday, and, and even the day before, Friday, AJ said, Dad, when you get up tomorrow, what you wake me up? You know, 
He talked a big game on Friday night. Saturday morning was not so much, you know, he wanted to sleep a little bit, but he did get up. Aiden and then both of them was up, ready to go, and they, they went with me. And we spent some time together doing some work, doing some things together like that. Julie was able to take Annabelle to a couple ball games in between. We finally got home and t- helped take care of my grandpa while they were gone and v- vice versa, just kind of juggling everything in life, but just spending a little bit of time with them. You know why God says I'll take pleasure in it? Because he takes pleasure in his people when they're being obedient to him. You say, I got much to offer. Listen, little is much when God's in it. We sing a song like that. That's what, that's what the song says. And that's true. That's what the Bible teaches. He will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified. Do you know that God can be glorified just in a few folks who are willing to be obedient to him? You know what this country needs? You know what this community needs? You know what your families need? You know what your neighbors need? They just need some people who are able to glorify God because they're willing to give God their all. That's what this country needs. That's what this community needs. That's what your family needs. So I ain't much. It's okay. God is. You know? You say, well, I ain't been much of a dad or I ain't been much of a mom or I ain't been much of a kid. I ain't much, been much of this or that. You know what? Just, just ask God to forgive you in that and then repent and make a fresh start today. Just go to the mountain and get the wood, build the house. And let God have pleasure in it. Let God be glorified in it. What he says, consider your ways. Look what happens. You looked for much and lo, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew on it. God said he did it. Why? Why did I blow? Well, because my house lies waste, and you run every man into his house. Don't look back, but it's like 12.07. Some say, I already know that, Brother Anthony. I looked at my phone. I looked at my watch. I already know because you're going to preach longer than 12 anyway. But how come when it comes to things of the Lord, we're on like a set time schedule? Huh? Like we can show up late to it, and we can leave early when we're there. Right? When it comes down to other things in life, man, I mean, we, we're, we're 15 minutes early. We're willing to hang out later. We will put whatever effort it is that it takes. You know, PlayStation 5 is out. Some people got it. Some people didn't get it. Some people tore it all to pieces. Some people can't stand it. Got the newest technology. Give whatever it takes. Some people bought as many as they can buy so they can Resell my, Dwayne can ask me about it. I didn't really know what he's talking about at first. He's got a new, new Xbox. He can flip that thing on eBay, probably make twice the money on it. He said, is that, that ethical? I said, just tithe on it, brother. No, I didn't say that. But I meant that. I didn't say that, but I meant that. Just tithe on it, brother. If you can make a profit, tithe on it. No. Um, I'm teasing. But what do we do? We'll give money. We'll invest in things. We'll invest in things. And it's worth if it's, That offering plate comes by, tying our shoes, going to the bathroom. Huh? Hello? Hello? Why? 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 Why do we do that? The flesh, the flesh by itself don't like the things of God. We got to crucify the flesh. We got to make a decision every day. I'm going to let Jesus live through me. He says, every one of you, you bring home a lot. I blow on this little. My house lies waste and you run every one to your house. Out of sight, out of mind. Get by where the temple's supposed to be fast as we can to get home so we can be comfortable. He says, he says, therefore, look what it says. The heaven over you is stayed from dew quickly because I'm, I'm I want you to hear this. I'm going to read it. I'm not going to say a whole, whole lot about every passage, but you want to listen. Why is the heaven stayed from dew? Why is the earth stayed from her fruit? I called for a drought in the land. Let me tell you something, folks. Our own personal lives, our communities, our country, 
Be not mistaken. God is the Lord of the harvest. He can let the dew come. He can let the rains come. He can let the drought come. He says, I've called for a drought. I've called a drought upon the, the land and upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, uh, upon the ground that bringeth forth, look what he says, upon men. Who would ever thought? Who would ever thought? We mean a drought. You know, the fact of, of a population been growing or not growing is of the Lord. Let me tell you what man does with it. When man's in control, 70 million people are boarded. And they call it choice, and they think it's a good thing. One of the most heavily deb debated political topics is that of abortion and Roe versus Wade in this country. Who would have thought the life and death of an infant, an unborn baby, would be one of the most heated, debated type things in our quote-unquote civilized country? Who would have ever thought something like that? It's disgusting and barbaric. It's terrible. It just really is. I'm thankful for the grace of God. I'm thankful for the forgiveness that's available to anybody who's ever had an abortion. God will love you. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will make you whole. And he will do his best to help you grow from that point on. All you got to do is ask him to forgive you, and he will. Cleanse, turn from it. But I'm going to tell you that the idea that it's okay is horrendous. And he says right here that I put the drought upon men. You, you know what China's struggle is right now? These people that's in population control is exactly what they do. They do it all the time. They don't care one bit. They don't care. The older folks mean nothing to them anymore. You can't contribute. They're done with you. They loose things out like the coronavirus and like other things. They do that. The Communist Party of China, not all Chinese people, I'm saying the Communist Party of China. They do these things like that. You know why they do that? They do that because they want to be in control. But you know what they're struggling with right now? You know what they're struggling with? Population. They control so much. You know what they ain't got? The workforce that they need. Think about that. Think about that. They think that they are in control. That's a place they don't want to do with God. God says, okay. Okay, I'll put the drought even upon your reproduction. You won't be able to reproduce. I send the drought upon the men, upon the cattle, and upon all the labor of the hand. I'm the one who sends the drought. Why are we struggling as a church? Why are we struggling as individuals? Maybe we need to consider our ways. Maybe we need to consider some things. Maybe while the things of God have been put on the back burner and we think we're going to go about our life, maybe, maybe some mandatory shutdowns and quarantines and, and all these types of things might bring us back into a reality that our little jobs, our little hobbies, our little gods that we've made of ourselves, that they ain't what we thought they were. Maybe. Just maybe we get to a reality check. You know, just maybe. I mean, we're slow learners in the United States of America. God allowed 9 11 to happen. Let us know that a big old superpower, only superpower country, entire world, be brought to our knees by just a couple planes hitting in the World Trade Center. Just like that. Just like that. Oh, for a little while we were shook, but it didn't take long for us just to get back to normal. You know? A little bit of struggle here, a little bit of struggle there, and we think, hey, we're fine. We can't be. Listen, how do we know that God isn't going to call for a drought? Time to consider our ways. It says there that Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest with all the rim of the people, obeyed the voice of of the Lord their God. What do we do in response? Just obey. It says the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people did fear before the Lord. We fear the Lord and obey the Lord and then it goes on to say what happens. Then what happens is 
that God responds unto them, and listen to what he says, four words in verse 13. I am with you. Isn't that enough? Man, that's awesome right there. When God said, I'm with you, then it says in verse 14 that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the governor, of Joshua, the high priest, and the people, the people, and they came to do the work of the Lord. Man, when you and I are willing to hear the word of God, fear him, obey him, his response will be, I am with you, and he will stir us to be about his work. That's what we need, a great stirring in our lives. But we've got to be willing to say, we've got to be willing to say, I'm willing to obey. I'm willing to obey. I'll fear. Because listen, you think God wants to blow upon the abundance so it's little? No. God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt, a land of bondage, and he brought them there to Kadesh Barnea on their traveling, sent some spies into the land, and what they see? A place that flow with milk and honey. They seen places where they were carrying gigantic bushels of grapes. Several men have to carry this. God says, I'm going to give you houses you never built. I'm going to give you vineyards and gardens and, and all things you never planted. All this stuff I'm going to give unto you. Just follow me. They had one of them business meetings. I mean, they stupid. we're still stupid, but they had a business meeting. And they had that vote. And Joshua and Caleb said, not a problem. Not a problem. I make the motion, Joshua said. We're going to the promised land. Caleb said, I'm going to second that. And Mother Ted and Tan stood up and said, ain't a chance we're going. Too many giants in the land. Joshua said, did you see the milk that was flowing over there? So what? You see them giants? You see them grapes they were carrying? Yeah, but did you see the giants carrying them? You seen them giants drinking that milk? You seen them giants carrying them grapes? You seen them giants tilling up that garden? You seen them giants living in them big houses over there? Well, them houses look good. Them grapes look good. Them milk looks good, but them giants are in the way. They forgot how quick that God just drowned the Egyptians in the Red Sea. The whole entire Egyptian army the world power of that day. And he can't take care of some giants in the land of Canaan. But he can go. 40 years in the wilderness. Old generation people have to die before they can go in. Settling from manna, settling from manna from heaven. Don't get me wrong. God will send me some manna. I'm going to eat it. But they, instead of the milk and the honey and the grapes and everything that God wanted to give them abundance, guess what he had to do? Blow on it. You're going to eat the manna. You know, they had boiled manna. They had fried manna. They had dried manna and chocolate. She said chocolate manna. I don't know. But they had manna scampi. They had manna everything. Stir fried manna. You know, they had it all. Manna, though. It's manna. They got tired of manna, you get them filled them up with quail because they complain too much. But that's what they settled for. One of my whole point is this. God wants to bless you. God wants to be a blessing to us. He wants us to be able to be used by him. But we got to be willing to hear from him, obey him, fear him, be stirred up by him, and get to his work. The governor said, we got to get to work. Why is it that there's a problem when a political leader says it's time for us to do something with the Lord? Why do people like it bothers them? Why? Even people who go to church, it bothers. Because we say, it's supposed to mix politics and religion. I'm telling you right now, I wish our governor would fall on his face before the Lord Jesus and really give his life to him. You know how good that would be for the state of Kentucky? You know how great that would be 
if Mr. Andy Bashir would repent of his old sinful ways, his godlessness, get out of that old apostate pagan church that he's a deacon at and really he born again, that would be a great thing. It'd be a great thing for the state of Kentucky. It'd be a great, great thing for the babies of this state. It'd be a great thing for the economy of this state. I want to fix the problem. It's not found in the political party. It's found in the name above every name, the Lord Jesus. I wish he'd repent. I wish that all of our local leaders around here, they don't want to just say that you're trusting God. You say, you don't know all of them over here. I don't know all of them over here. But I know this, that our political leaders right here, they need to follow after the ways of God, period, period. And I know what they didn't do. I know they backed down. I know they backed down and compromised. You know how I know? Because they give in to alcohol not too long ago. Clay County went first. And Laurel County said, well, they ain't going to outdo us. They ain't never outdone us before, and they sure ain't going to outdo us on this. And they went right on with the alcohol, too. And we both sit right back, and I'm like, well, that's a good thing. You know what? Shame on them. I don't care who they are. I don't care what church they go to. I don't care what they claim. Shame on them. How is God going to bless if we don't fear, if we don't obey, if we don't follow? He's not going to, folks. It won't be God blessing. And if you want to see a progress, I don't even like to use the word progressive. Disgust me right now. You want to see progress? That's... It, it, it'd, be, it'll be Satan that does that. You say, well, sure, you want Cain left from the presence of God. And you read in the book of Genesis, Cain left from the presence of God. And what did he do? He went and built cities, folks. You want to see some progress? He's seen it. He built cities. You know who, who started the instruments? The descendants of Cain. I'm not saying anything wrong with instruments. I'm just saying they seen progress. Metal workers, they had instruments. They had entertainment. They had everything that you can imagine. You say, you mean in the very beginning? of civilization, yes. They weren't a bunch of cavemen going around dragging their women by their hair, beating people over the head with a stick. That's evolution. That's not what the Bible says. But read it what it says. Satan went ahead with Cain, and he prospered. But then, guess what the end result was? A flood. Because people followed that way. And destruction came upon the entire human race except for eight. Let's consider our ways, folks. Let's consider our ways. Let's hear from God. Let's repent. Let's fear him. And let him be with us. Let him stir us. And let him take pleasure in it. Let him be glorified in it. And let his work be accomplished. Let's wake up. Let's wake up. Where are you at? Listen, I can't stir you. Only Jesus can. But why are you going to respond to him today? You might be visiting today. You may be a member here. It doesn't matter. This altar is open for all of us. You to come do business with you is an with the Lord on an individual level, and then start building from there. For instance, if you're a husband and a father, you know, guess what? Daddy, husband, you need a man up today. Examine your own heart and understand that you're a leader at your house. Man up. See where you're at with the Lord. Whatever business you need to do with the Lord, come do business with them. Lead by an example. Lead by an example. Mama, Wife, kind a woman up. See where you at. So y'all can be parents to your children in the ways of the Lord. You know, let it grow. Starts with the individual, then it goes from your little sphere to us as a church. Pastor, deacons, time to man up. It's time to step up and lead. Starts right here. Starts right here. Don't start nowhere else. Starts right here on our knees before God. Sunday school teachers, any other worker in the church, you've been sitting over there on the fence wondering what you're going to do. It's time to man up, woman up. Some of you young people, time to step up here. It's time to let God have number one spot in our lives. 
And it starts right here at the most important part of the service, the invitation. What are you going to do with the word that God has brought to you? What are you going to do with it? Right now is the most important time. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to ask Brother Jamie to come, and those are going to help with the invitation, and as they make their way, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning, asking you to move during this invitation. Lord Jesus, the people whom Haggai was preaching to were too comfortable and content in their ways. They started out well, trying to be, rebuild your temple. They found the opposition. They got, they stopped, and then they grew comfortable in that spot. Lord, I pray that right now we'd examine our own lives and see as we're supposed to be working on the temple. We are the temple. We're going through a process of sanctification. You're the one beginning the good work, but we're supposed to be cooperating with you. We can start with individually today, Sam, where we at. And then maybe we can think about out from that to our families, to our spouses, our children, other people that make up our families, us as a whole as a church. But I ask, Lord, during this invitation that we would take heed to your word, and as you spoke to us, we'd respond to you, and that we would give you honor and glory today because we have heard you, we have feared you, we have begun to obey you. Therefore, you take pleasure in your people because you say, I'm going to be with you. And then you stir us to be about your work. I already ask you to move now. We trust in you to do so. In Jesus' name, amen.